Hello, everybody, and welcome to another PMP end of month review. Uh, so what are we doing here? Well, we are reviewing the end of month submissions into the PMP Google Plus Hobby community. Uh, as always, everybody each month, uh, they make a pledge, they show their progress, and they put it up as finished projects. But if you have something particularly special that you want an extra review of, a deep dive on, that you want particular advice on, then you can post it into end of month review and we'll review it on the show. So that's what I'm going to do. It's just me uh, right now. I may be joined by uh, Eric here in a moment, uh, but it may just be me for the first part here, although we'll have we'll have our full crew back for the latter part of the review post-coffee break. Uh, if you're interested in joining us in our hobby community and the PMP, you can look down below. You see the link right there. And of course, what I want to say right up at the top is... The same thing I say every month, but it, I mean it every month, that I enjoy doing this review. It's a lot of fun. I love uh, helping people out. I love seeing everybody's work. But our members of the community that are commenting every time, giving feedback, answering questions, those are the real heroes. That's everybody who's making this community great. I try to comment as often as I can. We're all busy. You can't answer every post. But when you see a question, when you see somebody share a mini that you like, give it a shout out. Say, hey. That looks really cool. Or if they have a question, answer it. If it only takes a few seconds, just a few seconds of your day can completely change somebody else's. And by being positive and exchanging information with each other, that's the community we have. That's the community I want to build. So thank you to everybody who's been so active and so sharing and making this community truly fantastic. All right. So with that being said, uh, let's jump into the review. So I've got it locked on me here. I'm going to go ahead and screen share. And we're going to jump over here. All righty, let me make sure that's all recording okay. Yep, we're good. Okay. All right, so uh, let's start out with uh, John Gallant, who brings us uh, Ibisu from the board game Rising Sun. Uh, and he said he's looking for reference on the skin tone choices, the free hand, and the basing, plus any other items that are good or need some work. Okay, so let's take a look. So it's a board game mini, um, first off, and I think that's the most important thing, you know, we always think about because... <laughs> With board game minis, we generally are going to have sort of a different standard than uh, than if we wanted to, you know, than than other things. Because with a board game, you got to get the whole board game painted, so you're not taking everything to display quality. Okay, so that being said, sure, happy to give you some feedback. Uh, so let's start with the freehand. Um, the freehand looks pretty good. Um, like it's, I can see you've got little fishes and stuff. You're, I mean, all in all, it looks very kimono-ish. You may want to do a little more in-between designs. Like, I like what you did up here with this part, but then down here we don't have it. At least that I can see here, maybe it's, like, hidden. But a few more of those kind of things, those sharp, thin lines just kind of dragging around with some kind of brocade pattern might be kind of cool. Uh, just because kimonos tend to be quite busy, and freehand that's just kind of sticking out there is, is fairly obvious. Uh, like, that is to say, it looks like it's drawn as opposed to like it's part of the fabric or something like that. So the more visual confusion you create, the more chance it looks like it's actually part of the thing. But yeah, all in all, pretty good. Your lines look pretty sharp. Um, you know, these look like fishies, which is what you're going for. So sure, mission accomplished. Looks like a couple places our paint got a little thicker than we'd want. But again, for doing freehand on a board game mini, I, I think you're you're in the right space. Rather than worry about tightening up any of these, I think the better plan would be to, like I said, just have some in-between patterns here. But all in all, I like it. Um, on the basing element. So I think these are like little colored rocks that aren't... I, well, I don't want to jump ahead. These don't feel painted. And non-painted elements always stick out. So I think part of the thing was you said you wanted to talk about, you know, doing the resin. And it obviously shrunk here a little because you used something to hold it in place. Um, so, like, it's only on the inside. I mean, if you're going to do a resin pour where it's actually vertical, you've got to cap it at the very edge. And then when this kind of thing happens, you need to, like, use gloss varnish to smooth it out and stuff like that. Because you want it to run to the edge to sell this effect. Um, a good trick for smoothing out, like I can see where this is still rough because it was, you pulled off whatever you had to keep this locked up. Um, the trick with this is to heavy applications of gloss varnish. Uh, you can also use 
uh, well, two things. First, you take really, really, really high grit sandpaper, like a thousand plus, and you really smoothly rub this and get it smoothed way down. Then you gloss, then you rinse it off because you don't want any of that sand in there. And then you gloss varnish around it. Okay. And that's how you get that like crystal clear sheen um, down. So that's number one. Um, and that'll, that flesh that out. But, you know, that being said, like the pour looks fine other than the edge. Like, I think you've got that just fine. Everything looks appropriately in there. It feels like the normal gems, just like these were little unpainted things that you dropped into the resin. I don't have a problem with it in theory. It's just, they kind of stand out a little bit. They're probably a little too bright for being at the base of the thing because it's like nothing else up here is that bright. Even the fish, which could have very bright elements to draw the attention back up. Like the problem is when I look out here, like stare at it like this and relax your eyes. What do you see? You see the gems, right? Like relax your eyes and take in the whole mini. What stands out to you? Focus on nothing. The gems draw your attention because they're so bright. You don't want to generally draw people's attention down to the feet. Um, your, the counterbalance here, by the way, would be to put some bright elements into the scales, which I think feels appropriate, like rainbow fish and stuff like that are often bright. So you could always add some elements up there, really pop that eye out, that kind of thing. Um, by the way, I, I really like the texturing on the fish's head. I think that actually looks really nice. So, you know, same with the scales, like the fish, there's nothing wrong with the fish. It's just, you could use that opportunity, uh, to balance out those bright, shiny elements. Uh, as for skin tone. Yeah. I mean, I think it's fine. Uh, I think you could add some more tonality to it, probably some more sepia tones, a little bit of red, that kind of thing. Like, especially here around the bottom of his belly, there'd be a, you know, decent ish shadow there. So something like some sepia around here, very thinned or some red sepia tone, something like that. You could do it with Reichland flesh aid. You could do it with some very thin sepia ink. You, you could go all over the place and all of that would be fine. Um, but that a little more contrast in those areas, I think is what I would tell you. But all in all, it's a very cool mini. And I mean, like I said, for a board game mini, it looks great. And it's a good place to start with your resin pours. They're, this is a very tough thing to do, okay? My best advice for you is don't try to do vertically. Don't try to do resin pours with actual vertical height first. Just do water elements on the base, okay? Like that is to say, just standard old, like leave little puddles and stuff like that. Build up and do little puddles it's much easier in the beginning. And that'll get, that'll get you the hang of actually working with it until, you, uh, until you're more comfortable. And then you can do the vertical pour. But I think it looks good. Well done. All right, so next up, we've got a submission by Bleep Bloop, who brings us his Aether Void Pendulum, done in his Bleep Bloop standard masterful non-metallic metal style, his extreme high contrast that he works in. So here's how that looks. Uh, you know, obviously a great looking, great looking piece here. Uh, I dig it. So, I mean, all in all, I don't think you need to tell me or I think I need to tell you, Bleep Bloop, that you're really good at blending NMM. I think you know that. I think this, that your everything you do proves that. Um, and I love the contrast. The way you've balanced out the light here is fantastic between the primary reflections and the secondary reflections. So I think that all looks wonderful. Um, but here's my one challenge for you. This thing is too clean, okay? Like this is perfect sweeping NMM. And I don't like that in this case. What I mean by that is this is this big giant death pendulum, right? I'd like to see it a little bit messed up, like some slight scratches and light catches and stuff like that. So what I would challenge you for here, by the way, this is like A plus work, obviously, this looks great. I'm just challenging Bleep Bloop so we can give him something to work on. What I'd love to see is some small micro scratches, dents, tiny things, little light catches, little spots throughout the steel. Probably, you know, directionally like this, where the pendulum is hitting things, has been hitting things like, you know, a couple things like that. A little couple dots and scratches to give the idea that this thing has cleaved through something and, and, and scratched just a little. And I think that would actually sell the NMM even more. I think if you did just a few small ones, you'd really, really sell the effect even stronger. So just a thought. But all in all, this is masterful work. And I mean, anybody who's doing NMM could stand to learn from, from Bleep Loop, who always does an incredible job with it. Super awesome, man. 
All right, here we've got Doug Risley uh, with his uh, Borka bust. So let's talk about this guy. Um, so this is uh, one of the busts from P3. And it's uh, a very, like, I like it. It's just a very confusing bust to me because it feels like these are teeth, but they're not. It's like a lip or something. And then this is his teeth. I don't understand this thing. But that being said, let's talk about it. Um, so you wanted some critiques. Okay, cool. Uh, so let's talk about what we'd want to do here. Um, first of all, on something this size and this scale, like picture this guy with his whole body and how big he'd be, right? This is a very big scale compared to what we normally work in. Like this bust is quite large too. Um, so with something this big, we want to make sure that we have, uh, you know, things sort of smoothed out. So the thing that jumps out at me is like this transition between this purple and this blue here. And here, here, like that's rougher than we would probably generally want um, at, at this scale, because it's going to be very obvious that we've got some rough transitions here. Same with on the backside of, of this. Now, if we were going for texture or something, I would say, okay, but I don't think we're going for texture here. Like this just looks like a hard paint line that we need to separate, okay? Or that we need to make sure isn't as separate, I apologize. Um, so I would say, you know, smooth those tones in here, probably a deeper blue glazed over the transition line. And that's going to be what you need to do. Um, the, what I do love that you really nailed at this scale is I really love the bone up here coming out of his head. This is fantastic. Like, look at this wonderful transition. Look at the striations in the bone. That's, that's great. That looks perfectly in scale. Great work. Uh, let's scan through here and we'll take a look because this one's nice because it has the eye. So I like the teeth. I like the texture on the teeth. Obviously there we are going for texture so we don't want a perfectly smooth blend. I would still pop slightly brighter up here. Like you could still do this hashing style, but I would still make the tops of the teeth a little bit brighter. You know, plaque and buildup is going to tend to happen from the lower parts. The top of the teeth chew things and so get scraped clean. Buildup happens like this. And so striations are becoming more down here. Because um, I assume this guy still eats. So, um, so you know, something like that. Uh, the eye, um, I really like. I love the red tone as a color choice. I think that, like, color-wise, I think all this works really well. Um, the... What I would say is at this scale, you could probably afford to like thin out this extra black line a little bit more. Like I don't have a problem with having a, a, a line. It probably should be this thick. Like this should probably go to gray. The edge of the iris to the, the edge of the iris to the white of your eye isn't a hard line. It's sort of a smooth fade. Like there's actually a bit of gray fade in there. So doing something like over this middle part here is probably what you'd want to do. But I like how you nailed the light spot. You nailed the the brighter at the bottom. That looks good. You may want to do some small hashes here to kind of catch at the texture of the iris. You can get that at this scale. Um, as far as the brushed uh, metal here goes, uh, I like it. I think that's good. You could probably do with some glazes to smooth out a little bit of the lines. They're probably a little too harsh. Like, I get what you're going for. You want this very, like, brushed look. And I think that looks good. That really translates. I think you might, uh, just a glaze or two to kind of still smooth it out a little bit, bring some of it down. Like, some of these places, it's really harsh, like here to here. Right here where there's a softer transition between the lines, it looks better than, say, here where it's, like, really, really strong. And we can just go from light to dark. Just a thought. Um, but overall, this is really good. Like, I, you're working with great colors. The crystals pop. The eyes look good. You know, so you've got a lot of great stuff going on here. I think really what I would tell you is it's just a, it's just a matter of refinement more than it's a matter of, like, completely changing anything because this is all really good work. So there you go. That's my thoughts. All right. Alan Thomas says he started painting his Death Watch for Kill Team. Um, and going from his previous feedback, he's trying to improve the contrast on his metallics. He's using inks, trying to get the black armor to read his black while still having some depth. 
Um, well, I'll tell you right now, it's very difficult to photograph this, but one thing would be stop putting it in front of a, a white background. You're blowing out the, when you put, try to put guys completely in black in front of a white background, you're the aperture on your camera's going nuts because it doesn't know what the heck to adjust to what light setting use something neutral, like a, like a, you know, like when you go to Sears and get your photo taken, uh, and you'll, you'll get better results with, with black, but this is the depth of it. Uh, at any rate. Um, so he says he used a dry brush gen zenithal followed by glazes came out in some, in some areas, pretty rough, a few more glazes and some matte medium varnish may help. Let's take a look. We'll see what we think. Okay. Let's spin around to the back. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it looks bad. Like, yeah, I can see where you're talking about. There's a couple spots where it looks a little rough. Sure. But sure. You could just do some glazes to kind of with some medium and smooth that out. All in all, I think it, it you know, pretty much translated, um, you know, what you're aiming for. Yeah, I can see a little roughness like right there or here. But, yep, a few a few glazes should get you back in the line. Uh, so I don't think that's too bad. My So here's my general feedback for you um, on these dudes. All in all, I think I think the dry brush and glaze technique has worked well. You've got some good depth in your in your black. Um, my feedback would be to then go in and get some stronger edges. Like I can see you did a few, but you probably want a few more, especially where they'd be strong, like here where the light is really hitting. Like you run a popped edge here, here on his eye, here on the front, here, 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 here. And I can see where you did some of that work already. So, you know, some of it's there, but you probably want to push that up even a little more. Um, with the, now to specifically answer the metallics, um, it's good. We've got a little more depth. We need to go farther because you still have like, this is still just very silver, right? There's no real difference in the reflection here to here. And these would be reflecting very differently in scale. So like, we want to pull some shadow to this area here, right? And that kind of thing. So you may want to look at like, I don't know what metallics you're using. I can see some visible texture there. So I feel like we probably... You know, like up here, we may want to look at maybe like some different metallics. Just a thought. Um, like this is whenever I can see visible texture pigment in metal. That's that generally drives me a little bonkers. But my advice would be like if you look at this guy's arm, this silver is all very similar, right? Now I can see where you added some shadow, so it's good. You're doing some work. We need to push it farther. Um, I got a couple different videos on this. So you want to make sure that you kind of get some shadow under here. Under this side should be very much in shadow up under here. You know, one of the reasons that it's good to work on non-metallic metal, not that these you, sh you should try these guys in it. I don't generally like doing armies in it. But just when you work on it, it makes you really think about where light goes. Like you have to think about where light goes. Um, and I would say the same thing here. Like his gun the sort of barrel here of his gun, right? Like there could be some shadow. There should be, this should be darker right here. So I would push that a little farther. Just really make sure that you, you get that really play with those tonal, that tonal variation. But all in all, this is a good paint job. It's clean. It communicates it. Um, I think you're, I think the armor is really good. It has a nice soft blue tone to it with still feeling very much like black. Um, there's probably like, you probably want to be very careful with color. On these guys, like you're you're bordering on a few on, on pushing the color boundary here. It it only really looks like it because the two of them are standing next to each other, and this guy's like red, blue, yellow, and this guy's green, blue, yellow. And I say yellow because you use gold, and gold's true color is yellow. Um, or sorry, green, red, yellow. Um, so you just want to be thinking about that. Like when I look at both, when I when I cover one of them up, it's fine. When I look at both of them together, there's too many colors going on. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what you do about that because <laughs> I know you're trying to match the Death Watch colors. And I, I think they have the red always on their blasters, but I don't know. You could always knock the red back or, uh, you know, or use something more neutral or desaturate the red way down or something like that. Um, but yeah, all in all, dig the bases look cool. Armor fade looks good. Little higher pops. And, uh, but yeah, really like the little gem targeting reticule thing on this guy's eye. That looks really nice. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff here. So all in all, yeah, very cool stuff. Yeah, glad to see the progression.
keep pushing it on those metallics and uh, and pushing it on your edge highlights. I think you're you're going to really make some some great forward steps with these. I can already see the progress. It's looking really good, man. All right, Nicholas Hyatt with his first submission and second unit ever painted. Okay, <laughs> that's uh all right, man. Let's see what we got. All right, Nick, let's take a look. So we've got some blue horrors here. Uh, so first off, we need to, let's, and I'll, I'll forgive you, Nick, because this is your second picture ever, but now we need to talk about taking pictures. Um, so one, don't take pictures like this, just on a random red thing on the background with a light like this. It's not how you want to take pictures. Um, like, go look at GW's photo guide. Go look at the video I made on it. Go look at anything else. You want a neutral background and you want diffuse lighting because it becomes very hard for us to evaluate when like this is overexposed lighting and a very bad sort of background color and all that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, so I want to be able to really, I want to be able to give you feedback, but it becomes very difficult when I can't actually properly evaluate or know what they look like because I don't think they look exactly like this in real life. Right. So that's number one. Uh, but let's talk about the actual minis, what I can do. Um, okay. So, uh, all in all, Blue Horrors are nice, simple models. These are great things to start on. And I would say for your second unit you ever painted, you're doing some really good stuff. Um, I can see the highlights here where you've pushed up the blue. That looks really nice. Um, their little ridges around their eyes all look good. Fingertips, looks like we're using some like dry brushing to push things up. That's good. That's all good. You could push some of those even a little higher, come in and purposely place a few highlights here, like on the ridges of the eyes, tops of the mouth, you know, that kind of stuff. Really, you want to make the face the brightest part of the model, okay? Um, so it really draws attention. Now, uh, as to the flame, uh, that all looks good. You've got the flame going the right direction. I think that honestly looks pretty great. You've got some nice white to to mid orange ochre to red transitions. Like here, we can look at this back here. I think that looks wonderful. Like you're for your second unit ever, you really have got a great grasp on fire. So that's wonderful. Um, now let's talk about these bases for a moment. I suspect what we're going for here is some kind of magical energy situation, right? Or like a, I don't know if you're going for a little portal or energy or what, but that's exactly my purpose or my point. Um, I think it's a portal. Is he stepping out of it? Yeah, I think you're trying to go for a portal. Yeah, because it looks like his foot is down in there. Okay. So it's a neat idea, um, certainly. Um, if you're going to do this, okay, like this is a really cool idea for a basing scheme. But we've got we've to do some stuff here. So first off, we got to get rid of these these Stonehenge discs or whatever these are. This looks like cavemen just invented the wheel, right? Um, it's just a round piece of cork and it's obvious as a round piece of cork. We don't need it, okay? You don't need this. It shouldn't be here. It's not doing anything. It's not serving any purpose. It's just looking like a round piece of cork. So jettison these, okay? Now, if you're gonna do the portal effect, all right, cool. That's super cool. Here would be my recommendation. Take some plastic, like from a clam pack or anything else that comes in a plastic package. When you buy a thing of like super glue and it has plastic, any flat plastic that comes in any package anywhere you got out of the store, start saving some of that. I have tons of it because I save it for this purpose. Cut it to size on the base. So you get a perfectly flat plastic clear thing. Prime that, okay? Prime it in white or something darn near it, okay? By the way, you got to do this without these guys in the base. So, like, do this before you put the guy in the base. You need to do this separately. And then do some swirl art on it. Get thick paint. Get it kind of wet and watery. And start squidging it down and wet blending it in a circle. And start pushing it together. Like, look up sort of tutorials on how people do this kind of, like, wet, paint, pour, art, or something like that online. Watch a bunch of stuff. Get inspiration. Because you've got the right colors here. The problem is they're way too hard. Like bright pink to mid magenta to purple magenta to dark blue to light blue. And every line here is super hard. And 
it's so much brighter. The central pink is so much brighter than your model. It's the same challenge as before. It draws all the attention away from the model. All I can see, again, scan out, let your eyes relax. What do you actually see? I see yellow and bright pink. I don't actually see the models. Okay. So you want to have this be much more squidgy, much more swirly twirly, and probably more muted. Like a little bit, if you're going to have this bright pink, it should be very small. Um, and then if you're going to do that, you need to really pop something up on these guys here to make them really pop. Okay. And then go and then set them down on top. Cause I think you got a really cool idea on your hands of having, yeah, I can definitely see like this guy's cut off at the knee. So like them coming out of the portal and popping up is a really cool idea. Like that's exceedingly creative. So I dig the heck out of that. I don't want to squash this idea. Do it like heck. Yeah, man, a whole army of blues and pinks doing this. That's a cool thing. We just need to have the portal look a little more. And by the way, do the swirly twirly art to the edge of the base. Make the whole, not, not the edge edge. This always should be black, but like out to the edge of the top of the base. Make the whole top of it a swirly twirly portal thingy in like that poor art style um, with those circular patterns, like a sort of magical vortex that these guys are coming out of. And I think you'd have an amazing basing scheme you know, simple as far as construction goes. It's literally just a thin piece of plastic painted over. But I think it would look amazing. You've got a fantastically unique idea here, man. I want to see I want to see more from this. Just, you know, jettison this cork piece. This isn't doing anything. This is somebody, you're using cork because you think you're supposed to use cork. Don't do that. These are, these are very, for your second unit, man, you are so far ahead of the game. You got great, you have great highlights. You could push some shadows, some deeper shadows on the blues a little bit, but... Your models look good. Your fire looks great. This is an amazing idea. Keep at it. I want to see more units. All right. Scott Palmer uh, with his completed Cypher the Fallen Angel. Uh, he says he got sick of it partway through and his heart wasn't in, her, in it. <laughs> okay. So he had said uh, he's looking for some feedback on the NMM. And... Uh, and, and so that's where we can talk about. We'll, we'll focus our attention there. Well, with NMM, you have to be in it to win it, man. You can't partially do it. There is no, there's no halfway with NMM. You either do it or you don't. Um, because it's, it's not the kind of thing you can lose hard on. So the answer here is yes, we can, we can tell where we did it. Um, so there's a couple different challenges I have with this guy. Let's talk them through. First, let's go back here. Let's let's look at the non-metal parts, okay? This red is extremely flat. This whole thing is this color. It is the only existence of this red on him other than, like, from that angle. When I look at the front, you have red down here, right, on the inside. Okay. And then the back of his little guns. But when I look back behind from this side, all I see is this bright glaring thing. So when you place colors around, make sure that, you know, no matter the angle, you have it color balanced. So we would have wanted red like up here or something, right? Um, that's a small thought. Two is, other than the red, this guy is too monotone. Um, like that is to say, everything is so brown or, or in this spectrum that it's very hard for him to stand out. Now, I suspect this guy is probably fine cast. He looks rough like fine cast. I don't think that's your fault. I just think that's the model. Um, but you still want to do things like clean him up as much as you can, like drill the gun barrels. We have undrilled gun barrels. We always drill our gun barrels, drill a gun barrel, or I'm going to call you out for not drilling your gun barrels, drill your gun barrels. Um, I like the, the texture a lot on the coat, um, but it's probably some of your lines are a little too thick when you're doing this kind of cross hatching. Probably want to keep it nice and thin. And I wouldn't do it to everything. Like it's here kind of present on the the leather as well. I see as I think as a nice contrast, you could have taken the leather into like a really deep brown, right? And, and made that stand apart. I know the whole guy's supposed to be muted, but you still want areas of pop. A thing I really like you did that does ca catch that out is this hair, right? Where you have this nice highlight right here where the light would be hitting. That I think looks really good. Um, all right, so now let's address the NMM, the elephant in the room, as it were. Here you go. This will be the shot that I want to talk about it with. Okay, 
So, yes, I, I assume you're going for gold on the guns. Which, that's fine. I mean, if that's what you color you want the guns, okay, cool. And on the back here. So, the answer is we need to push our ochre way up. Like, too much of this is brown and too dark. Um, so, we need to take the, our ochre up here, or at least orange it out, orange yellowish. You know, you want this to be warmer. And then we want to pick our highlights more. So first of all, on this shape, like that's fine up top here. The light theoretically we're talking about a zenithal situation. So I'm okay with that. But this should be brighter. And these rivets should be popping like crazy with dark shadows around them. Um, when we look at his back thing here, there we go. Same thing here, right? We, we just have too much of the same color. It doesn't transition enough. You have dark enough, but we don't go far enough. We need to go way up into the light and really show that whole, that whole, we need to walk that whole transition. Okay. Um, if we're going to do NMM and then we'll need to edge like the whole thing. The light should be reflecting all that. All these rivets need to be picked out. Everything needs to be sold. When it's NMM, it has to all work or it falls apart. Okay. It's good practice. Because I can tell it made you think about how the light's going to hit. Like on the one side, it's flat. So you did just a straight down light. On this side, it's rounded. So you brought back this type of, like this straight line highlighting. That's really good. It's good that you saw that difference. That's that's the right type of thinking. Your, your, your head's in the right place. So let's talk about this shoulder with steel right here. Um, when you're doing this sort of thing, you don't want these so close together. Like what you're replicating here is this is your primary. And then you want your reflection light here. Or, or a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary reflected light, which is also fine. But in which case, one of them needs to be superior, one of them needs to be secondary, and one of them needs to be reflected. So broader, thinner, uh, and broader but weaker in general is how you want to think about it, okay? Um, so, like, and again, pushing that contrast way up. The darkest spot on this guy, if that's what you're going for, should actually be here. And then this should actually be reflected light because light is going to come down, hit this thing that's sticking straight out and go boing and bounce right up here and should be giving this a weak brown light reflection. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's that would be my advice. Overall, it's a, it's a cool model. And I love that you're experimenting with this stuff, man. Keep it up. Um, by the way, the red is balanced fine from the front. I, I have no issue with that. It's just... It's an it's a interesting lesson that when you're doing your color, you want to be thinking about it all over the place. I'm not sure why you made the grenade so bright. That probably, I don't know if you were trying to balance the red. If this was to be a plasma grenade that's like super hot, it's too hot because uh, it's very white and it's there's nothing else around here that's like that. So this because looks pink and draws too much attention. Beyond that, you're good. Okay. All righty. So... All right, next up, Quentin Alexander with his first post, post to the end of month review. He says he's been uh, painting for about 15 years, but he decided within the last two he wants to get better. Hey, I went through the same transition myself. Uh, still learning techniques and would love to hear what we say. Okay, he wanted a clean white next to the dark red with good clean decals. All right, and he would, you know, is the rivets dark enough and is there other weathering he can improve? Well, I had looked at this guy before, so I do have some thoughts. So let's talk about your goals and what you were trying to achieve and did you achieve them? Um, is your white nice and clean? You betcha. Do your decals look nice and crisp? They sure do. Smooth as butter. Okay. Um, is the panel recesses on the ochre dark enough or on this color, this tan? Mm, probably not. Uh, like, I think these lines need to be a little stronger. Are the rivets dark enough? Yes. The rivet problem actually has nothing to do with the ring around the rivets. It's the highlights of the rivets. You, The rivets themselves need to probably be popped out. Like, make them silver or touch them with a, the, a white or something like that. The contrast around rivets is exactly that. It should be high contrast. Um... So like, but I think you're, you're actually really subtle with most of your little rivet drops. And I think it looks really good. Um, sometimes it's easy to go overboard. I don't think you did that. I think they actually look quite clean and controlled and nice. 
So I think you just need to pop the highlight more. It's not the low light. So overall, this is, you know, this guy looks really nice. Okay. Like your work is clean. You're it, it, the, everything that you set out to do, you did accomplish. Now, let me get to a shot here. There we go. That's the shot I wanted. Okay. So my, my challenge for you here would be on things like color balance, right? Like you have this red down here. I have no red up top when I'm looking at him from this angle. I understand that the backs of your shoulder pads are red, but again, I can't see that from here. And if I look up top, I can't see these, right? So you may want to think about something like, here's a simple idea. Challenge yourself with a nice red stripe going like this. Red stripe. It's a machine of war. Um, so, you know, just like a simple red triangle stripe. Um, I think Duncan did this in one of the videos. Put a little triangle stripe on, on the helver, the the Helverin or whatever. Um, that could be a good way to push right up there. It would also create, like what I love about a triangle stripe on this dude that goes up here and down is visually for sightline purposes, it does so much. Um, one, it points lines out of the guns and creates a full diamond pattern, which is visually appealing. Two, it breaks up this top. And that's part of the problem. This top is so big and monochrome compared to the rest of this guy. So, you know, a little bit of like variation through the addition of a decal uh, or the red line or some kind of pattern or both is probably what I would recommend. Okay. Um, all in all, I know you said you didn't want to do weathering, so we'll, we'll stay away from stuff like that. You know, if you want a good, clean dude, okay, no problem. It's perfectly fine. Um, then what I would say here is, I do think we need to work on what we're doing with our metallics. The other thing that stands out to me is your, your metallics are all very clean and crisp. That's great, but they're too clean, right? Like, why is this tube? Is this tube really metal? Are all these tubes really metal? I don't know, maybe. Are they the same steel as this? Mm. Are these joints that are rotating, are they the same color as the rest of this? Wouldn't they have grease? or something in them that would make them not the same bright, shiny, or these pistons, right? Like these are moving metal on metal parts. I doubt they're the same clean silver as everything else. So even if you're not doing weathering, you wanna think about adding some tone and texture to the metal. My recommendation would be go watch my uh, oil washes video, cause I actually do it on a the bigger version of the night and show how you can do it to really easily get some interesting tones and colors on here. So that's the only thing I really noticed that jumps out at me. Um, but all in all, this is a really great looking knight, man. He's, you got a nice uh, nice color scheme, soft, but it's, it's, it's striking. I think a little bit of addition of like maybe a pattern or a decal or something on the top to break up this big flat negative space. It's a little too much negative space. In fact, you could do it opposite. You could do like a triangle boop boop and then have one down here going boop boop and kind of opposite and that would look pretty cool. Uh, but all in all, you were definitely successful with your goals. You used your microsol very well and masterfully. I think those decals look wonderful. Uh, so there you go. That's my thoughts and, and some challenges for you for the future. Uh, obviously these guys come in twos. So maybe we'll see the next one at some point with some other experiments. Uh, or bigger, or or uh, his bigger brothers. But thank you for your first submission. I certainly look forward to more, man. All right. Uh, Ty is playing around with this plague bearer, and he says, "What does we think of the skin? Is it too much, too few with the transitions? And what about the guts? It's matte varnished, and he wanted to give the impression of being slick through uh, paint application. All right." Well, let's take a look. So my first thought is, I love this dude. I think your work here is really great. Um, the sword is the classic sort of plague bearer colored sword. So I dig that. These always do stand out a bit much when you do this, because this is so divergent from the colors on the rest of the, the guy. Um, I'm not sure why the one green leg that seems strange to me. I don't know about that. I don't know about this choice. I think I would like it better if his skin was all in purple. But, I mean, it's artistic license, so whatever you want. I think maybe you were trying to balance the, the 
Nurgling with this green sick here with this one. It's an interesting choice. Uh, the problem is it doesn't make sort of sense around everything else. So I think what you could have done is just taken the bottoms of his feet into this green. Like, I think if, if that was your goal, the way to maybe do that would have been to take the bottoms of his feet and transition from this purple to this green. So, like, let's say from here down. I notice he does have a different leg. Like, this one's kind of a fatty, fat leg, and this one's kind of a skinny leg. So maybe that's why he did it. I don't know. So it's a neat idea. I'm just not sure about it all, all in all. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Oh, I can't. That's a very small picture. And I cannot zoom in. All right. So we may have to stick to the first picture to really give you some other notes. Um, I like how you did try to balance out the sword by having this extreme vertigree over here. That's not a bad choice at all. Uh, I think that did some good work. So I don't have a problem with the sword overall. I think it's cool when the sword is striking on them. It is a bit out of balance, but pfft, so be it. Now, let's talk about the two things you asked about, the skin and the transitions. Do they work? Yes, I think your transitions are actually quite accurate, especially for a Plague Bearer. Like, you're going to do, like, 30 of these guys. So, I mean, not everyone can be a masterpiece, like, to the point where you're running through 18 different, you know, skin tone transitions. So, so I think for, like, the quality of an army, you're actually really good here. Um, my, If you want to take it a little farther, then push some more of this red pinky tone you're using into some areas like here where the skin is being stretched here in between his hands a little bit here in his cheeks like even though he's a weird otherworldly demon we re we like it when we as humans our brains like it when we see patterns we understand and like red blood being in cheeks or you know around a facial area like that is something we recognize it's a pattern it's a structure we're familiar with so by utilizing that pattern you actually make the thing feel more real to people which will then simultaneously make it more disgusting because a thing that isn't doesn't look real it doesn't matter what you do as far as splattering blood and guts around a thing that uh, somebody's brain looks at and feels is real and then they see open guts whoa boy nelly that's what freaks him out right okay uh stick figure with his guts hanging out doesn't bother you Dead, probably picture of a dead body probably would. That's my point. The more realistic it gets, the more creepy and awful it gets. Now, as to the highlighting of the guts, love it. Like that you nailed, buddy. That highlight is masterfully executed. They look slick and wet. For matte paint, where you just place those highlights, mm, now that, molto bene. That is my favorite thing on this guy. You really got that. And, and for everybody else who's sort of asked about this kind of thing, people have asked about painting slick things. This is the way you got to do it. You got to bring up a semi-broad reflection to a sharp white point, right? And all the way down vertically. So it creates this sort of illusion. That's great. I dig it. Looks wonderful. So, um, yeah, all in all, he's a, he's a great looking plague bearer. Like I said, some very light touches of sort of crimson, maybe in the sides of cheeks or around here. Uh, sort of at the top of his breast, uh, like breast muscle, where this kind of uh, stretchy skin is happening. A few touches like that could could do some work for you. But all in all, he looks really good. I think he'd be, you know, you do twenty nine more like him, and you have a stunning unit on your hands. So, yeah. All right. Next up, we got Dan Reeves. He says he took a break, but now he's back. And he's happy to be back. So let's take a look at what he's got for us. Other than he has got some psychedelic ghosts. I can tell that as much already. So a lot going on here. All right. So we have our little goblin with our banner. And he's summoning he's summoning some some this is like a this this is on mushrooms. Like this is an amazing here we go. This is an amazing diorama for being on a tiny base. I don't know how big that base is, but it's not very big. Okay, this is like Grateful Dead concert stuff, man. I don't even know where to go with this one. You've you've blown my mind. I'm I'm blown away here. Um, yeah, I've got to really take this all in because it looks like he's holding a giant spoon. It's bright. It's colorful. It's psychedelic. I assume this guy did some mushrooms and he's hopped up now and he's bringing out the LSD ghosts. So, yeah. Um. It works. Despite the madness of colors, it really works. Like when I relax my eye, 
and just kind of let it travel around. The only thing that really catches it are these little flashes of blue. They might be a bit too intense because everything else is pretty actually desaturated. Uh, but that bright flashes of blue might be the only areas that are just a little, little, little too much. Like even knocking those back with just a few deeper shadows. And I think you'd actually bring this whole thing into, into, into quite a strong harmony. Same with maybe the purple boots. Just a thought. Green skin looks great. This like magic spoon egg thing he's got looks wonderful. That lightning effect on the top or this, this little like sort of spider web effect looks great. Uh, the transitions on the ghosts look really good. You may want to think about then coming back down on the blades here or out to their fingers. Like it looks like you push the light out a little on the tips, but if I was you, I would push it a little farther so that literally like it, my point being is that make it almost universal. So like the yellow and orange line is simply here. So this part of the blade would be in orange. This part would be in red pink. I think that could, be interesting for what it achieves you know same with pushing it down at the tip of their hands kind of making this starry pattern uh look like it's really the outer edge where they're just sort of connected to the heavens through this i mean aren't we all connected to the heavens man um you know through through this air top area here as far as the stars go that's fine you may want to vary it with a couple even tinier dots or splatter you may want to look at then some bigger stars like do a couple like of the sort of, you know, North Star, bling, twinkly stuff, like little crosses over top of a few of them to really push that effect. You want to be really, really sharp and thin when you do that cross pattern, like, you know, maybe in a little circle around it. Uh, sort of like the classic Christmas star look. But I know you can do that because you did it right here, like, so masterfully. So that's not a problem. Uh, the variation on the goblin's face looks really good. The mushrooms are what blow me away because that transition there, from that very rich natural red orange uh, color into that deep black, those look so vibrant and real. They're really masterfully executed. Um, all in all, this is a crazy diorama for for I assume this is probably your goblin shaman. Um, this is a heck of a if this is really like a play unit. Kudos, because it's pretty incredible. Uh, if it's just something you're actually doing as a diorama, kudos. It's pretty incredible. <laughs> so I really like it. Great transition on the nose. You may want to push a little bit of more pink into the very edge there. That's a minimal thing. Uh, all in all, it's, it's wonderful, man. I, I don't have a super much feedback for you. Like this psychedelic experiment is, you know, like all right with me, man. No, it's great work. And uh, wonderful work on the banner down here as well. So. All in all, a, an incredibly unique piece, and I keep it up. I, I don't even know. I can't say what I would want to see more of. Anything that is this creative, man, and you are welcome to submit all of this. I will look at all of them, drink it up. This is fantastic. So, good stuff. That brings us to the end for the moment. We will be back in just a second. Uh, I have to go... I have to go rustle up my cohorts to help me finish doing the rest of the review. So I'll go get a coffee and then I'll chase them down. And, uh, and we'll be back in just a second with the rest of the review. And we're back. Uh, changed clothes, got my coffee. And what did I do? But I found our two other esteemed colleagues, Eric and Kieran. Welcome back, gentlemen. Thanks. For I have felt so lost. <laughs> we yeah. were lost without both of you, but they're back. And we're going to continue reviewing the models tagged as end of month review. So here we go. Lock on me. Screen share up. Get into it. Here we go, gentlemen. All right. So we begin Ooh. with... Nope. Sorry. Other way around. Nope. We begin with Mr. Kenku Druid here. Uh, so Andy Walker says this is a Kenku Druid for his D&D campaign. Love it. I always loved Kenku. Super cool race there. Uh, all right, so he basically says, uh, you know, he's not sure about the pop on it. He's got two pictures front and back, and he's looking for feedback. Well, I mean, just from the picture, I can tell you that I like it a lot. Like, the green is very rich. It pops out. And he did a really nice touch here. You know, we talk a lot about color balance, and I think he did a good job because he 
you know, he said, okay, well, I've got all this green. What am I going to do to bring some over to this side of the model? Oh, I'll just turn the staff green at the top. Yeah. Why the heck not? Um, great, great choice. I will say that I would have loved to see you take a lesson from here and bring it down here in that making the cloak maybe go a little lighter at the bottom. If you were trying to communicate like a magical effect here, maybe this doesn't go to white, but maybe bringing in a little more of the yellow, uh, your sort of yellow green down here could also be a nice effect as the cape kind of fades out to that color, uh, just to kind of show that off. But all in all, uh, I think that one of the reasons the rivets don't pop as much, you had asked about the rivets and stuff like that, is you've got to dark line around rivets to make them pop. So a little drop of like a black ink or a null oil or something like that to really get those. So you have the brown and then a dark line and then the rivet that will pop those out. Um, we'll go to the other shot here. Let's, uh, we have a little, there we go. Back to normal colors. No flash, never flash. This is the right balance. The there's, other one is bad. All the meanings of that. Don't yeah, do. exactly. Um, so as to the cloak itself, yeah, I, I think it looks good. I think it's a little flat. And what I mean by that is not like vertically from when we consider the vertical stripes, you have really nice gradations. The problem is this is about as bright up here as it is down here and here, right? You don't have a lot of color variation in that regard. And so what I'd love to see is yet yeah, there's clearly a curve going on here where the light would change. So what I'd like to see is horizontal color gradation as well as vertical. So if we brought a little deeper shadows in on this line where the cloak is clearly receding in and we brought some brighter colors out here, right, at the, at the edge, um, kind of horizontally across here and horizontally across here. So we had kind of a mid to light to dark to light to mid. That could also then create the same visual interest we've got going this direction. Um, so just a thought there. As to the base, I understand like it's, it is what it is from Reaper. So they have these things. It's fine. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna beat you up for that or anything. Uh, I like the little pop of the red here and here. Be nice if we get and this is a good touch with this little patch. It'd be neat if we could get a little red up here somewhere. Uh, maybe a little symbol on the side of his cloak, like a little freehand or something like that. That could be another option to bring some visual interest to it. But you desaturated this, so it's not eye catching or or distracting. The blue on the pants looks really really nice. That's what I want to comment. This is actually a really nice color for this. It's soft. It's bright, but it's not overwhelming. This is a really good element of color balance. So um, all in all, I think this is well executed. You could push a little of the feathers, maybe a little more white here on the ridge, the edge of the face here, maybe bring out the beak a little, just so we're really, really drawn into his face. But that's some pretty minor touch stuff. Overall, this is a really nice D&D character. Looks great. I'm sure he'll, uh, I'm sure he'll, he's a bird who will probably turn into other animals, which is weird. So it's probably. like a bird who turns also into probably. a bird. Shalala, some fiends. They'll be shalala. They'll be shalalaing all over the place. Just yeah. nothing but shalaling. Shalala, <laughs> la, la. Exactly. Uh, isn't there? La la la. Shalala, la 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 la. Isn't there a uh, Garfunkel song? That's that's exactly what it is. Yeah, it's you've nailed it. You've nailed it exactly. <laughs> I look forward to your fall tour. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, alive. Exactly. All right, so let's move on to Anna Stroker and awesome. uh, his, his demon here. Um, so he's saying is this is kind of a first time uh, painting over a dry brush of Zenithal. Also not wanting to take a ton of time. So that, uh, getting a sense there's some speed um, painting here, some um, techniques, etc. cetera, um, cut or some shortcuts, he said. And um, I don't think there's any other view of this. So there's just the single view. Um <clears throat> well, there's there's definitely a lot of things that I, uh, you know, at first glance that I like a lot. Um, that one of the first things that comes to mind is if you look over on that axe, how the, the metals on that flat part of the axe, um, you know, uh, shade into the recesses, and you've got some really good kind of dull metal shine. So, you know, sometimes non-metallic metal gets is very high contrast or sharp in its lighting. This looks like it looks very metal, but it doesn't look like, like I'm not necessarily picking up a metallic paint, um, but it was done really well to, you know, look like worn out dull metal. And I like that a lot. Um, you know, also, you know, a lot of the brasses uh, obviously use some good washes. There's some really good tones on the skin itself where you see, you know, like the, on that, that arm that's holding the big ax, 
um, going from dark reds um, and browns up to a, a, a brighter red or scarlet. Um, and so I, I like the attention there. And it looks like you were able to achieve that, like you said, pretty quickly uh, with some shortcuts. Um, I like the pull of the blue in a number of places. You've got it down on his tabard, up on the, the hair, the locks up on the very top. And off to the side, there's some uh, the blue. There's also some looks like some blue in the um, the staff of the axe that he's holding. Um, so all in all, some really good things there. The thing that's probably halting me the most is we're a little bit monotone from the the torso into the legs into the boots. That 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 brown, that purple, that red, kind of blend together perhaps more than what we want in order to make this make all of that stand out so a couple of things if you were to kind of want to, again let's say that we we're trying to go quickly um so that we can uh like you said take some shortcuts i would take uh for instance the the boots and i would maybe go with a dark wash in addition you probably did some agrax on them they're brown let's get a dark wash on them and take them towards a brown black um, that would also tie them a little bit more to the axe and the colors in your metals, which would be which would be um, uh, pretty cool. I would also probably like to see that. I know that in his knee, knee pads and stuff like that, you've gone with like the red armor on the inside. You know, maybe we could go with that same uh, gray um, black metallic there again to to let you know, let the red kind of rest um, so mostly in the torso. Now, if you wanted to, the other thing I would do is if you do, if you wanted to keep the red down there to balance out the torso, then I would say, let's deal with the pants. And in to deal with the pants, I would say, <coughs> excuse me, um, what could be really good there is going with an off color or a complementary color. So uh, the, you know, if you wanted to pull that blue back in, you've got it on the tabard. Maybe you do that same thing with the pants there. Um, or you go towards, um, you know, you could go towards some green tones. Um, you would have to find some places for that green, like uh, in his that chest strap or something to that effect. Um, but the nice thing about, since you've got the red tones in there right now, if you used a green wash, um, that would probably work well with the the purple and have some good effects again you're starting to tint it a little bit of a different color um in order to complement the red i don't want to make you repaint and and do shading or anything like that or like re-highlighting the whole you know all of that but if you went with some tints or some some um glazes to to you know with some greens to to darken that up or worked with that blue color i think that would break up the space you'd have um <clears throat> excuse me, the red torso, a different color in the middle, and then back to red on his shins, um, et cetera. Um, I like the the bone work uh, on the skull to the left. I like it up in his, um, his horns. Uh, we've got skulls all around, so that kind of balances around, around and, and kind of works well with the bronze and such. Um, otherwise, I'd say, again, you know, like that strap on his chest kind of blends in. And then maybe... Maybe we go a little bit lighter red on his face um, or brighter color moving towards like an orange or kind of like somewhere between the red on his skin and the yellow of his of the bone so that we get a little bit brighter there. Because um, right now it kind of, again, we're, we're trying to help some things pop um, against all of that red. Um, I really like the what's going on in the base. It does look like you know there's just a lot of ashen and and charred stuff strewn about. Looks really good. Um, I think that's I think that's everything I've got. Yeah, no, I agree. You you yeah. hit all the things I was going to comment on. All right, all in all, good stuff. It's a good model. Yeah, I like it a lot. All right, so next up we got Lloyd Hiller with the first mini he's painted. Okay. So the first reaction that I have to, to Lloyd's model here is really first ever. <laughs> but no reason to disbelieve you. Um, but uh, but I could see that you have done your study ahead of time if you've gotten to here on your first model. Because um, uh, you, you came up with a wonderful result. The first thing that I notice about this model uh, 
is smoothness because that's the thing that most rookie painters tend to do is they'll paint straight out of the pot. Um, it, you show brush strokes, you show a little bit of gunk, you sometimes get a little bit of graininess in there. So whatever you've learned or whoever has pointed you in the right directions and taught you your first habits, uh, wonderful. Thank them for all of us, as well as you probably have already, uh, because paint application is, is wonderful on this thing. Um, now working with blues, can sometimes be uh, a challenge to get depth of color on those kinds of things. And you've managed to get that here. You've done that by doing a lot of the framing of the armor plates. And I think that the segments, the segmented parts of a space marine really lend to that obviously, uh, and the ultramarines especially. Uh, but I see that you've gone back in and you've reframed each of those differentiating parts by doing some black lining. Uh, which again is a, is a wonderful technique to to really add some some depth and some shape to the model. Uh, so I think that that's that's pretty wonderful. Um, and uh, I'm not the first to say this, but I actually read through the comments of others that have given you some feedback earlier in the month, Lloyd. And the one that I tend to agree with is that um, at this stage, uh, you have gone with the sort of highlighting by, by framing all the edges of the armor plates, which is which looks great. Uh, and it's gonna be wonderful as a tabletop model. But down the road, if you wanna experiment with it a little bit deeper, the kind of highlighting that you would go into instead of just framing on all top and bottom edges of each of these, each of these segments is make a decision about where the primary light source is coming and just highlight to that side while you shade the other side. Um, uh, and that's, uh, that's a bit more advanced. I, I, I'm, by no means should I suggest you do that on model number two, um, but, uh, but have that in the back of your mind. Now, as you move through a couple uh, snapshots here and show the viewers, Vince, the one thing that I am also super attracted to, on that, especially on that second and third frame, is the metallics that you've used. Uh, the gold metallic is, is very vibrant. It's rich, so whichever whichever paint brand you've chosen to use here, you've, you've nailed it. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're, if you're trying to please Vince, it's probably the, the, the Vallejo metals that you've used there. Is that the ones you use? Is that the ones you're always pimping? Oh yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. That's what I thought. Cause it comes through very rich and, uh, and you've got that sort of modulation of shadow and highlight on there. It really reads nicely, perfectly. Um, now another, quick possibility for improvement while we're looking at this model is uh, because you've been so tidy on the model up top, uh, a little bit of tidiness around the base. You're probably seeing it now, Lloyd, now that this is on the screen and for the internets to see um, that little tidying up around the base uh, really sells the idea that your, your model is a professional piece. Um, and then the other tip that I might give you in relationship to the uh, water slide transfers that you've used on here is uh, you may have to do a little bit of extra dull coat on there. If you've got a pot of brush on matte varnish, that's probably the best thing to do on top of these things. You can seal the, the transfer down and you can also bring it in line with the paint job instead of looking and, and capturing more shine uh, like the like your ultramarine symbol up here on the shoulder pad does, and uh, and a couple other spots. Um, that's minor stuff. Uh, but the other minor thing that I think I might add is you have a couple of light points on here. Uh, one on the backpack uh, forearm, and then of course the lenses of the Space Marines helmet. Um, take a look into doing gemstone style painting. Like if you ever uh, take for reference, look at. Uh, Look at elf models or in the 40k world eldar models they've all got loads and loads of gemstones on them and uh if you do those gleam lighting in that fashion too it really creates a, an extra sort of a sort of a point of detail that, that can really attract the eye and, uh, and make it look great so there's just a few things that, are, that i think are uh are possible fixes uh but uh, at this point in your painting career, if this is number one, I don't have much more to tell you that, except for you, you've done wonderful, uh, whatever, and, and I'll reiterate again, whatever references you've used up to this point, 
keep drinking it in because uh, you, you appear to be a great student. Yeah, I totally agree. Like, it's just, it's just amazing work for, for your first model. And it does show like somebody who put in the work and the research first. So that's fantastic. Yeah. I dig it. All right. Good stuff, man. Okay. So. Where to next? Next up, we've got uh, a D&D &D character from Caspian Cleason. We've got a very unique model from uh, from John Crair. And we've got a pack of uh, plague bearers. Old Nurgle. I guess this is the D&D &D character review month for me. So Caspian has his new D&D <laughs> &D character. Maybe also some kind of druid as he's got a bird. But I guess it could be a ranger. It's probably a ranger. All right. So let's take a look at this guy. All right, there we go. So that's a good shot. Okay, so the first thing we'll note is that um, we've chosen, like, I assume he, he if he's ranger-ish, which he looks like given the tunic and, uh, you know, the, the presence of the animal companion at all, uh, then I, I can see where, for most of the model, you went for a pretty natural color scheme. You know, lots of browns and stuff like that. But then all of a sudden, and, you know, greens down here in his trousers, but then down here, all of a sudden, with this, this sort of lower cloak part, we just like go badow and drop some hard purple on us. Now to the back, we can see that it climbs up more. It's kind of this weird half cloak thing. Um, but the challenge is out here, I don't have any of that, right? So what we get is this, you know, we get this really bright shock of color. You gave us a little white up here to try to draw the attention back up. But a couple different things that I'll, I'll sort of talk about here. One, um, be careful when you use hyper bright colors like this. Like this purple would be fine if you had added in a lot of yellow. Um, because yellow is the complementary color to purple and you can desaturate out purple by adding yellow. It'll turn a near brown purple and it would then, you know, you could then go with this purple and it almost wouldn't even matter because it'd be so weak. So weakly purple as to barely register. And it would also look more in line with the natural tones. So the second thing I'll say is if you're not going to push purple up and around because you look at it and go, well, there's really nowhere else to push it. Um, let's say you don't want the bird to be purple. Like if, if, this, if he's a magic bird, then the bird being purple is the obvious choice. But I suspect if this is like a grounded D&D &D character, you're, you have like an eagle friend who's just an eagle. He's not a magic eagle. At least not yet. Um, so, so then desaturate out your purple. The second thing I'll say is when we use a bunch of brown tones like this, we've got to see separation. Like the straps are the same as the sheath is the same as the tunic is the same, you know, and on and on and on as the bird. Like, I understand that you probably do have some minor variation here. Cause like the bird looks a little darker, but it's not enough. Like it's not enough to tell when I zoom out, this just looks like brown. Right. And the only thing that sticks out is this white. So you went for highlighting eyebrows. That's fine. But the problem is, is that like eyebrows don't show up on people or if they do, they show up extremely minimally at this scale. So like these are bright shocks of gray white. It makes him look 80. Now, if your character is in fact an old man, like a real old man with like bushy, crazy eyebrows. Okay, fine. Then spot on. But I, I'm not... I'm guessing that's not, in fact, your D&D &D character. So, like, if you're going to use the white thing, you want really, really, really hyper-fine, like, check marks, and they should be more in, like, a gray tone. And then you want to come back in with a really sharp brush and even do a little, like, dark gray, almost black, to kind of break it up and make it look like they're extremely minimal. In general, eyebrows in regular 28 mil, mil scale are, are, are almost always better avoided. But if you're going to do them, they need to be hyper-minimal, hyper-fine. <laughs> The other thing I would say is just more general attention on the face, bringing up the skin tone on the face into general lighter tones. Like you hit it here with the nose. I'd love to see a little more of it in the cheeks, you know, lips, that kind of stuff, just so this pops out a little more. And then finally on the bird, same story. Um, you know, if it is an eagle, cool. Like let's see some white, you know, or if it's a hawk, okay, let's see some ochres and some yellows and stuff. Like hawks have cool colors in them. Um, I don't mean cool as in cold. I just mean like cool as in unusual. Like hawks can still have bright patterns in them so you know really take those feathers up get these feathers bright and popping because they'd be thin and if he's spreading his wings like this light's going to be traveling through them you know um, wings are 
very thin things overall. And uh, so show it like the light passing through by making this a much lighter color. And then I think that'll also help you get some more brighter tones up here to help frame the miniature and draw more attention up and away from the purple. Um, so those are my thoughts uh, overall. But seems like a fun ranger. He's got a sword, a gun, and a bird. I think he has everything you need for success in D&D. &D. So there you go. Mm -hmm. As we all know, those are the three quintessential elements of all successful D&D &D characters. <laughs> I didn't know guns were allowed in D&D &D these days. Oh, sure. I mean, you know, it always... There's always been firearms in D and D. It just depends on the time period in the world, right? Like some worlds have some worlds and time periods have guns, and some don't. So there you go. Right. Uh, you know, if you're uh, if you're rocking out in say Lantan in the Forgotten Realms, where the gnomes have mastered, uh, you know, pow gunpowder, then oh yeah, those those are those are gun toting gnomes. You know, <laughs> they're ready to they're strapped. That All right. Terrifying. Have you ever today. heard of? Uh... Of pistols at at high gnome. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so next up, over to you. With that pun, I feel like nobody could follow that up. So back to you. All right. So we got a couple of uh, kind of cool, like cyberpunk or sci-fi characters. They feel very cyberpunk to me. Um, uh, maybe it's just a little bit because of some of the latest video game trailers for cyberpunk twenty whatever it is seventy seven. Um, but, uh, so some cool things that are happening here, we've got a use of metallics, uh, for the, the cloak, which kind of reminds me a lot of two of like, um, oh, what is the, oh, here's my poor anime memory, um, ghost in the shell kind of stuff. You got sure. your, your clothing that kind of deflects light, etc. And you've got a little bit in the next character as well. If you want to cruise over to that one one over um and this guy's pretty cool he's got kind of it's kind of like a security armor police officer type of thing and they um i really like what they've done to highlight like just spots of neon almost as if there's like holographic display um that sort of thing so like on that shoulder you've got a dark blue underneath a light blue and uh you know it looks it looks like some freehand there um on the face and then on the knee pad or on the hip pad um, so, so I, I think some really cool things. Everything's pretty dull. Some some things are shiny. Um, a use of metallic. If you flip one more, it'll be the same character. Um, uh, and you'll see some of the, that armor has kind of the colored metallics, etc. cetera. Um, so what I would say, and with this guy specifically, is that some of this armor, the boots, et cetera, could really use some more detail in order for us to enjoy kind of the nuance of the the details and the way we often see some of that is in line highlighting and so if you look here specifically um you know a couple of things one you could go with slightly different colors for the pant legs and the boots that would certainly give you one layer of separation and contrast it doesn't have to be necessarily it could be the same metallic blue as the as the um, armor and why the reason it works for the armor is because you've painted panels and so you've got it that surface broken up with other um, textures other colors etc so similarly on the pants and the boots we want to do some of that same thing so wherever you could you know maybe it's at the ankles it looks like there's a belt loop going or a, a strap going around the ankle and another above the calf that could be a place uh, where you either are using some of that, that metallic blue color or a slightly different color gray color um, to break that up and then the pants like i said could go to that blue color that bl metallic blue um or they could even be that that bright blue um you know if this is a science fiction security officer um or something to that effect i mean it this the way that style typically goes is sometimes those can feel like superhero uniforms or um, you know, like sports team uniforms. So they can be bright. They can be, you know, do that sort of thing. Um, and I would just carry that up to the the, the gauntlets or gloves, et cetera. The, the other way, so yeah, and then line highlighting that. You don't have to line highlight with, with just a gray in this style. You could line highlight with a neon color and get a very Tron effect. You know, uh, in the movie Tron, it's like there's piping everywhere that's neon color. And you've already used that in some places. So you could do something either with that same blue or go with a different color, um, a green, um, 
and and try and get some highlights around some different areas. So that would be something I would suggest with this character uh, of doing more to separate out the boots, the leggings, and the gloves because there's there there's some cool um, textures, there's some cool um, shapes here. Let's go one more. I think this might just be the back of the front character. I support um, that Tron idea, by the way. I'm in cool. favor of that. Cool. Thank you. Um, so here again, you can see kind of how cool that cloak looks, and I hope that looks cool on the tabletop when you're using it. Um, the here, like the what I saw too, though, was that the pant leg. Um, you've got some good highlighting on like the sleeves and stuff, and you want to carry some of that same thing, you know, a um, technique into the pant legs. The top of that calf there would be the brightest part of that blue on the calf on the blue jeans or whatever that is. And so making sure that that's the brightest spot, not the darkest spot as it seems to be right now. And if we go, um, you see that leather strap, um, again, that you would want to maybe go darker towards, um, the armpit or as it's starting to loop down and underneath the body, it'd get darker. Uh, and you could even line highlight that. So the edges are either, uh, that would be another place where going with a neon color in this setting could be really cool especially like a pink or a green to offset the, to balance that blue. Um, and then if you, if we go back all the way to the beginning to the left, Vince, uh, we'll get to the front of this character. Um, you've got a couple of places again, where you've got some of that blue, pink, green right there on the chest. Um, but work that into the knee pads, work that into that shoulder pad in the same way that you have uh, with the other character. Uh, I really like what you've done there. These, look like they could really use that and kind of fits that. And so I'd say lean into that a little bit more. Um, the gun is, um, how do I put it? I like what you, the color choices, you know, having this earthy color with the sleeves and maybe that's some of it is we've got a lot of these electric colors and then we get browns, which can kind of throw it off a little bit because we're not used to seeing as earthy of a color. Um, so the, you know, I don't know if going with a different color there would work better or with that blue or something. Um, the last thing I guess I'll say would be on the gun. Um, it's white is a tough color, um, because it, it kind of comes out looking kind of chalky when you, it goes on too thick. And I like the style that you've done where you've left the recesses really dark and you've got high contrast. I like that a lot. It lets us see the detail of the gun. Um, but what I would, what you could do, you could certainly go with any other color besides white. And in the, you know, dystopian future, everything's you know, colorful and cheery because life sucks. Um, what I would do is if you want to, if you were going to stick with this white is that you work with a cool color. So you maybe base it with like an Ulthuan gray or a, like a blue gray that's lighter. And then you could do the white just up at the top, the most uh, up uh, top facing of the gun, of that 3D space, of that block space. And then you, again, line highlight all the edges of the, the gun around by the hand and all the shapes, et cetera, with white over that gray. And not only is that going to help, the, the gun will look like white. It will look like it's more represented in 3D space. And that white line highlighting will look very futuristic. So these are really cool models. I like some of the choices you've made with the metallic uh, paints. I think this is the perfect genre to use those in. Um, I think you could uh, do some more uh line highlighting especially with hard edge things to help us break up the space and get a sense of some of these uh details um i would maybe ditch some of the earth tones just because you've got such cool and vibrant colors um and then uh with the with that white i think you could do a lot with that gun to make it even more because that's a big focal point of this model um especially when it's white uh, and so giving it a little more attention with some darker colors for the, sh for the sides, just a slightly darker gray blue. And then the line highlights would just help that pop. So yeah, those are my thoughts. Very good. All right. Right on. Next up. It's time to get gross. 
Oh, <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like it's been a long time since you've seen some Nurgle? I mean, not for me personally, no, <laughs> but for you guys, it might have been longer. Maybe. Uh, good. All right. So here's a uh, clutch of uh, Nurgle fellows from Felipe Palayo. Um, in his comment, uh, Felipe wanted to ask, uh, because he couldn't decide on a single color tone to do for the skin, he just uh, hit the spectrum. And, uh, and I would say to you, that's fine. That's perfectly fine. Grandfather Nurgle is an all accepting father of all races, colors, and creeds, as long as you only have one eye and some kind of open sore. So all these skin tones will work just fine together. Um, there is maybe a couple of things that, that I could offer though, to sort of bring those in and a more unifying thing so that when you play, present them in a unit, um, it'll feel a little bit more tight. Uh, and that is, and I think the simple answer is that you just do a general sort of shading wash on all of your skin tones. Um, so let's, let's go through a couple of individual colors here because he sort of on the next frames, he separates his different color choices, Vince. So on these first ones, you've done that sort of olive color skin and that works really well because you have a bit of a brown in the deep recesses, etc. So that one's fine. I think you leave that one as it is. Now moving on to the next frame, when we're going into this sort of more orangish almost, um, what I think I might suggest that we do here and on the next couple of color choices as well, um, is hit it with a sort of a brownie green wash. And, and uh, the one that Citadel does, I think is called the Thonian Camo Shade. I really like that one. Um, you could, maybe if you were in the uh, Secret Weapon neighborhood, you could get things like uh, wonderful colors like sewer water or baby poop. Uh, those are two washes that they make that, would, that could work as well. And if you wash those over and you, you will do two things with this, you'll get a little bit more depth, especially around the rib cage and the musculature. Uh, you'll frame all those buboes and sores a little bit better. Uh, but then flipping ahead to the next colors where you're getting into greens and purples, it'll shift those colors a little bit more in line with the first two that we saw. Because these last two are kind of the outliers that are away from the spectrum. Um, and what this will achieve, Felipe, is you'll still have that distinctive color difference in skin tone from a distance. Um, but when you get in closer, you will see that they're a little bit more unified and they'll feel more like a, like a, like a unified unit, I guess. Okay. Um, and then just uh, one more frame will show that, that purple tone that, uh, that Felipe did as well. Now, while I'm on this one, so now that we've talked about how to unify the skin tone, a couple things that I want to touch on here. I want to talk a little bit about the basing. Uh, first of all, great that you have uh, incorporated a couple of textures on this and you've really set them in a place where it's, you know, a slimy, nerdly world. The one that I like the best that you've created is actually this one that your banner bearer is standing upon. And the reason I like that the best is because it doesn't feel forced. If we flip back to some prior pictures and scan through a couple of events, what I'll point out is you have a couple guys that are on islands of, of, uh, of this sort of ashy dirt and a couple others previous where it feels like it's manufactured and they're specifically standing in a place posing for a photo. Um, so a little bit more of that sort of broken up, you have a couple of tendrils rather than islands or, or single streams coming through. Uh, again, it's that standard bearer on the far right that I think looks the most natural in all this. So, so think about that when you're doing your, your future ones, because obviously I'm assuming that you're not done with Nurgle here, you got a lot more to go. Um, so think about that. That'll also help with, you know, sort of more natural uh, and unifying unit look. Um, and there's one other thing that I wanted to touch on here for you to think about when you're doing future ones, and that is horns. First off, really great that you're moving from a dark sort of rotting horn and it moves through into a lighter brown and eventually to a white. That instinct is fine. What I want you to think about though and try to work on is to make sure that it doesn't just 
change from one color band to the next color band as you move through. So from a distance here, what I mean, if we look at your champion that's at the very front, starts dark brown, moves halfway up, and it immediately stops and turns into a light brown. And then a little bit further up, there's a hard line where it turns into white on each of those horns. We've talked about this in past um, PMP reviews. And, uh, and what I want to reiterate here again is that there has to be sort of overlapping fingers of color. So you kind of have to draw your, your white color a little bit down further in a couple of fingers, not the whole way around the horn, but in a couple of stripes down. And the same thing when you move into the next color. So that there's always a little tiny bit of an overlap of one color onto the next before it actually goes into the solid color. That'll help your horns look a whole lot more natural and, uh, and, and less like a, like a manufactured thing. Okay. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. That's enough to think about for the time being, but, uh, but again, I want to close out by your thoughts that Felipe, you're fine. Like go with the color spectrum, do some wild things. Um, grandfather Nurgle is all inclusive and he will, he will take all the, all the races of Nurgle folk. Under Completely his agreed. Like the, the variation in color makes them so much more interesting too, like as units, you know what I mean? Like they're, they're still clearly all plague bearers. They have such a distinctive look, right? As far as the silhouette goes. So you don't need the paint to make them hang together. Uh, they also yeah. all are, have rotting guts falling out of them. So that's a unifying element. <laughs> yeah. And all those little buboes and sores. And yeah. Those osteos are all the same too. So that's, that's another unifying element and the weapons. So I say go so for it. Together. Yep. Dig it. All right. So next up, we got two more, and then we're we're done for the month. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about these together. First of all, we got just Tim, who says he's got his converted beast man. Someone pointed out he kind of looks like a shaman because the open hand. He didn't intend to make him look like that. Um, he used the zenithal dry brushing with brown this time. Turned out a little darker, but he doesn't doesn't think he looks too bad. Here's his questions: different horns and pointed them forward, more like a real bull. Any thoughts? Uh, what do we think of the fur needs to pop more and other tips? All right. So let's all take a look here. Well, first, if well, I can comment on, on the horns, cause I just did. Sure. I would say same thing. Yep. Um, <laughs> same, same thing. Yeah. Same thing. There's a little bit of evidence of you have a little bit of overlap here. Um, that's certainly evident, but, uh, but I think you can pull, especially the white where it gets to the end. I think you need to pull that back. And, uh, and have a little fingers of overlap. You've got some wash where it's kind of transitioning in color, but if you have some actual, you know, striations, think, look really close if you have any evidence and reference of a real horn, and you can see that it's almost like fibers. That of, when I talk about fingers overlapping, it's almost because the horn itself is a fibrous thing in a way. Yep. Uh, so, so think about that and try to draw that into the horns. Yeah, agreed. Um, you know, you asked about the fur and I do agree. I think the fur, especially on like the, the legs needs to pop out more, especially as we get toward the knee in the same way you would highlight the knee of, if it was flesh, the fur should follow the same rules. So this should come more toward ivory, toward white, same with the hooves down at the bottom, right? More like the same thing you said up top of the bone also applies to the hooves, like pop this, pop these, uh, and on the top of the ridges here, like you're kind of uniformly highlighted because it looks like probably we just dry brushed it and then washed it, which is fine. I think the skin, the dark skin actually works really super duper well. I have zero issues with that as a matter of fact. Um, but I think the fur needs to pop out. Uh, Eric, what about you? What do you got? Well, I was going to say, first of all, you're not just Tim. You're our Tim. <laughs> That's right. So don't, don't be so, uh, don't sell yourself short. So, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really liking the bronzing, the bronze tone of the skin. Um, you know, it, it feels animal, but at the same time, you know, there, there feels something very, you know, I don't know, he, also humanoid or human about it. Um, so I think it, it's a very unique looking beast, man. Um, I'm liking the golden fur, um, yeah, there's so much that I'm liking about it in terms of texture and color, etc. cetera. Um, everything you guys talked about, uh, yeah, I'm in the same boat as terms of, you know, having some more gradation and having pushing those things a little bit further. Um, yeah, I think the, the pink staff probably is the thing that stands out the most to me. Um, 
and I like that we've he's added that color in there. But yeah, seeing it some more places, I see it on the medallion, but maybe. Yeah, a little more, a little more red around the model maybe, somehow. Maybe, maybe a red element toenails. on the base. What if he paints his toenails? Or put some red energy in his hand. <laughs> maybe he is a bit of a spellcaster, uh, right? There we go. Yeah. Uh, or or has some blood down on the skull or something yeah. like that. Sure. Yeah. But. I would also say rust up or do something with that weapon. Like I like that you edge the weapon, but I would love to see something scratches, dents, rust, weathering, more gradation. Look back to that exalted. Uh, Deathbringer or whatever that that uh, the corn demon we started the review with, right? The way he had like the aged effect, yeah, and then like a, a, a silvery spot in the middle to create the reflection. That could be a good way to go with this. That like we can pick any of these things. I think they'd all any of them would be fine. Um, but yeah, something like that. I imagine this guy not as a shaman, but a guy that just wants a sandwich really bad. Sure. Hey, I'll take that sandwich. Yeah, sure. And he's not a shaman to ask for it. Oh boy! All right. So the last one we've okay, got. So we're done with this one then. Yep. That's how we. <laughs> that's how we know we're done. The pun is done. <laughs> the pun signal's done. All right. So last up, we've got David Robertson, who says, "While well, he was covering well, from getting his." I'll be clear though. That was the pun ultimate uh, miniature of the. Episode, Stop it! So. Stop it! <laughs> So David Robertson says, while well, he was recovering from getting his bicep reattached. Oh, good God. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> All right, man. Hey, now you just became my hobby hero for the for the review uh, because <laughs> I can't imagine that that's a minimal recovery time. But he's like, oh, I can still paint. I'm good with it. Let's do this. <laughs> so like right on, man. That is dedication. So he wanted to know what we thought of the rust. OK, so here's what I think of the rust. Um, the rust looks good. The silver is too bright. What I mean by that is things weather not uniformly, but somewhat so, right? Like this whole thing sat out. So like these spikes, which you show me are metal because you've got rust on them in some places like here. So this is the same metal are still like hyper bright silver and you kept like bright silver edges. I don't mind some silver being in rusted metal, but it should be used very sparingly and not near other rust. Like here you've got silver edging rust. That's going to ring as as fake to the eye because this would all this would have all toned down. It would have all gotten oxidized. Water would have collected, it would turn black, the black would turn brown, the brown would turn orange, the orange would turn yellow or pink, like depending on the particular composition of the metal, somewhat uniformly. What what you what tends to reveal silver is when you get a scrape, right? When something has been scraped away. So if you show me like damage lines, like a ch -ch -ch -ch, something hashed into it, you know, something bashed into this thing and revealed the the bright shiny metal underneath. Okay, I'll buy it then. Rivets can also tend to stay that way. They can also be the first thing to rust. Um, so like you can do some bright silver on some rivets, you just need a dark edge around them. But what I would say is, in general, you want to tone all of it down when you go toward weathering and really be super minimal with any kind of bright silver. You want your most of your high tone that's still metal to look like this darkened steel, right? Um, as far as the orange and the actual rusting pattern goes, yeah, it's fine. I have you, you have a nice mixed tone of browns and oranges and stuff like that. That looks very organic and realistic. Um, rust tends to gather on edges because edges tend to gather water and oxidize the fastest and the hardest. So where you actually have a lot of your silver highlighting should actually be orange. Um, so like, let's just take, I'll give you a quick example. We'll take this little piece right here. This door, if this were really this rusted, this part here on this edge would probably be orange. So with this top edge, this is extremely exposed. Would ext water would absolutely gather on this near horizontal surface. And this would have rusted hard. Like this should be an orange edge, like pure orange, right? With the orange rust, little dots and stipples of it around here. Um, so I think if you kind of squip swap that, you'd see the, that that's where you would see the effect. Um, that's my initial thoughts. Gentlemen, what about you? From, so I think you're spot on for realism from a standpoint of, of does the, this technique look interesting? Like, I feel like it does bring a lot of visual interest to them. Um, 
to what you have going on um, because you've got these bright whites and you've got these dark darks and you've got the oranges in between. So I think if you're trying to achieve kind of this different level of contrast, I think it works really good. Um, you know, maybe the, the orcs came by and they sharpened all those edges just today. Uh, and maybe that's whatever. Um, or I don't know. So, I mean, I think there's some, some cool things about it. Um, but I think you could also, like, like Vince said, you could probably achieve that with some other, like going with even brighter orange in those spots. Um, like, I mean, so one of the things I liked, I mean, I like some of the dark oranges that are going on, but that kind of cap on the left-hand side that has kind of, that one has some really cool variations in the orange. And I think getting into that bright orange where you have silver could be really cool too, where you, you mute, you know, the orange everywhere else is more muted, but then you go with that bright orange on those sharp spots. Um, and that would also bring out a lot of visual interest and keep everything very, like Vince is saying is, um, it would bring you your contrast, but it would, it would lean you more towards the, the realistic side of rusting. But yeah. Yeah. In addition to what you guys have said, I think the other thing that sells a realism of a, of a thing like this is a little bit of extra grit. So it yeah. actually add texture to this. So if you can get a lightly textured paint even to, to put it into a few places where it would sort of imagine if, imagine if the rust was crumbling, like we've all seen this in the world where the rust crumbles and it actually yep. turns into what looks like a granular dust. So anywhere there's a little bit of a shelf, um, so there's some pipes over here on the right side, for example. Um, there is, you know, a couple of bits of shelving here on this middle panel and, and a few other spots where there's an opportunity for that. And, and obviously, once you have texture on there, then when you take your, your orange tones uh, and, and brush up on that, then it actually shows a little bit better uh, because of that texture that you have. So that's the one, the only single thing I'd add to what you guys had to say. No, nope, that's all true. Yeah, I think a general brown tone brought into the metal could also help, like almost a seraphim sepia wash, right? Because old metal tends to brown out, right? Just sort of general weathering, like the detritus of rain left on it tends to have a sort of vaguely brown tone to it. So something like that could also help. But yeah, overall, it looks cool. And uh, full kudos to you, sir. Way to, way to stick to it. All right. So, gentlemen, that brings us to the end of our month. And that, of course, raises the question, the most important question of your favorite for the month. Damn it. Now, damn it. Dang it. <laughs> I will pick first since I had the benefit of being here for the first part of it. And uh, my choice is easy. I'm going for Dan Reeves and his goblin shaman almost diorama uh, from the 16th. Uh, I loved it. It's crazy colors. It somehow balances. He's playing with all sorts of different imagery and the banner, the moon banner, the crazy ghosts being integrated. It's freaking wonderful. I dig the heck out of it. So there you go. That's my pick. All right. I burnt off time for you guys to look. <laughs> who's Who's got a pick? You have a pick or you want me to go? Go ahead, Eric. So my runner-up is Bleep Bloops, uh, Endless Spells. Sure, sure. Um, you can't go wrong picking that um, by any means. Uh, but I will say uh, I've been uh, toying with the new um, Armagers from uh -huh. Yeah. Quentin Alexander's, uh, you know, camel and red color um, just really, really stood out to me. Um, has cool soft tones to it and... He doesn't. He's not getting too much into weathering and that sort of stuff uh, up in the carapace and and that sort of stuff. Obviously, I'm sure you gave him some tips on that. I did. Um, but I really like the scheme a lot. And and um, yeah, so it really, it's a really complimentary scheme for that model. Yeah, I, I liked it too. So you you hit on you hit on exactly what I said about it. There you go. Nailed it. It's like I. It's like I just know what you would say. It's You're like, in my I mind. Don't have, I don't have opinions of my own. <laughs> I'm just part of the Vince factory. <laughs> You've scaled right. yourself. There you go. 
Kieran, what about you, buddy? What's your pick? Well, I think the one that I'm going to choose is uh, there's a Nurgle Herald done by Thibaut uh, mid-month. Yeah. And what intrigued me about that is he, again, went a little bit out of the realm of, of color, color skin tones for, for Nurgle, and he did a, a purplish skin tone. But the other thing that intrigued me, too, is, is how he balanced that with um, sort of a, a teal green. You know, a sea foam green. He used it on the base. He used it on the weapons, and uh, and I think that was a unique way, unique take on it. Um, his paint skills are, are very good, so the execution of it was great, and uh, and it just it, it it captured a different, intriguing look on Nurgle. Yeah, so that's my no good pick. That was a fun one to review for me. Believe me. <laughs> uh, all right, so. As always, thank you to everybody who submitted. If you want to join us on your hobby journey, like I said at the top of the show, I'll say it again at the bottom. Uh, look down below. There's a link. We'd love to have you. Whether you're just starting out, clearly, first miniature ever we reviewed this month, or whether yeah. you're this is your old hat and uh, a long master, everybody has their next personal step to take on their hobby journey, and we'd love you to take it with us. Uh, and I'll also say what we always say, which is we're happy to do this every month. Um, it's always fun. I love giving this feedback. But the real heroes are the people who are commenting on the posts. So if you're a part of the community, share your feedback. When people ask questions, when they ask for feedback, when they post, comment, tell people you like it, change someone's day, give someone the encouragement, answer the questions they've got. And I've seen, I continue to see so much interaction, so much positive sharing. That is what makes this community great. And please, everyone keep it up. That is the real work in this community every day. So thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone. It is appreciated beyond measure of what we've built here. We've had a lot of new members in the last couple months, especially with the hobby challenges going on. So I want to speak to all of them who are joining and say, share, share that positive feedback, help people out and offer that constructive criticism where you can. Uh, that is what makes this community great. So gentlemen, any closing thoughts from both of you? Uh, yeah, I want to expound upon what you just mentioned there about the hobby challenge that we're midway through. Uh, not too late to join, boys and girls. Uh, I was away for, for a period of time, so I'm behind. Um, but, but I'm going to try to get in there. And you yeah, have until the end of October for the Get Her Done Challenge. So look under that tab under the hobby challenges and, and get in there with us. Yeah, and I believe it's pinned to the top of the community, too, so you can see the rules for it there. Um, and that runs until the end of October. So, And you know, like you can complete it with as little as nine models. So, I mean, mm -hmm. it's not, you know, there you go. Anybody, anybody, no matter what you're working on, it's about getting that stuff off the shelf of shame and getting it painted. There you go. Eric, any closing thoughts from you? Um, no, I mean, I, I think uh, the summer's been a little bit harder to keep up with things it's been weird vacations and all that kind of stuff um but i'm looking forward i'm I, every time we we come on here and review stuff i'm inspired and uh humbled by uh, the cool stuff that you guys are bringing so keep it up keep uh working on it if not for you for the people around you uh to be inspired and and keep going so absolutely all right well with that we will say thank you very much to everybody and as always We'll see you next time.